Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 137. What advantages can a build system provide for a Python developer? And what new skills are required when working with a team of developers? This week on the show, Benji Weinberger from Toolchain is here to discuss the Pants build system and getting started with continuous integration. Benji is one of the core devs on the Pants build system. He talks about the software tools and processes a build system simplifies. We discuss how an individual developer can take advantage of continuous integration. And we also cover some of the expectations when moving into professional software development. If you've learned about or started to use tools like linters, code formatters, import sorters, type checkers, and packaging systems, a build system is designed to combine all of those tools into a simplified one-step process to share your best code. Benji explains concepts like fine-grained invalidation, moving to a mono repo, and using a build system for data science projects. He also shares his tips for getting started with Pants and how to find help within the community. The InfluxDB time series platform empowers developers and organizations to build real-time IoT, analytics, and cloud applications with timestamp data. Learn more and start for free at InfluxData.com. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hi, Benji. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. You had reached out a little while ago to talk about the build system that you you work with, which is called Pants, you had been on Talk Python recently, and so I thought maybe we could steer the conversation in kind of more of a beginner to intermediate kind of direction, and maybe we could talk a little bit more about how somebody gets involved in using tools like this. And you had kind of suggested that to me, and I was like, that sounds fantastic, and um, it made me think about a conversation that I had with Dane Hillard. He had written this book, the title is Practices of the Python Pro. We had this conversation in episode 49 about these sort of challenges in developing into that. And it was really much more from a software design aspect. I thought, wow, this sounds cool. We could kind of talk about it more from like a, a tooling aspect and understanding some of those things as maybe becoming a little more of a, a professional in that way, less of a programmer and more of maybe that concept of a developer. I guess maybe the first thing we could start off with is tell us a little bit about the tool that you you were involved in creating it, right? Yes, that's right. So I have been uh, one of the creators and core maintainers of a build system called Pants for many years now. Uh, the system has undergone several iterations. Its first few years was more of an internal tool. There wasn't much of a community around it. But what we unimaginatively call Pans V2, we launched in 2020. And its focus, unlike earlier iterations and earlier work I'd done, it had a very strong focus on Python use cases. It supports other languages as well, Go, Java, Scala, Kotlin, Shell, and there are uh, several others in the works. But there was a huge amount of focus in both the design and implementation phases on Python. There are several reasons for that. Just kind of a, as an aside, <laughs> where'd the name come from? Oh, so the name has a, a history that's completely irrelevant now. It started out in its very, very, very earliest iteration. All it was was a Python script to generate ant.xml files okay. for use <laughs> in JVM builds. That's all it was. And so it was an acronym of like Python ants. Yeah, okay. Even though that is... Not a single line of code uh, remains from that very early legacy, but the name somehow carried through all these different designs. Yeah, it makes me think of worldwide pants. 
David Letterman's company that he had started. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think he just thought thinks the the name or the the word pants is funny. Um, um but it kind of it's, it's kind of suiting in some ways. <laughs> yeah, well, it's especially funny and odd for me because, as you can probably hear, I'm from the UK originally, and over there pants means underpants right <laughs> so it's much worse yeah people don't like that word like they may dislike other words here <laughs> at the time you were involved in it as more of an open source thing and then the sort of organization tool chain came after that exactly so pants started out really as again that very early version i referred to and some iterations that came after that were really more of a thing that was hacked together uh, initially internally at twitter where i was working at the time this is about 2010 okay and then a little later at foursquare where we open sourced it out of twitter and and then i uh, was working at foursquare and and it was a very sort of small scale thing pants v2 which I, as i mentioned we started working on under that same umbrella, but with a very different design in maybe starting in around 2015, 16, 17, and finally launched in 2020. And that was an open source project with that we actually tried to build a large community around, as I mentioned, more around Python and Python use cases. And that community is large and growing and, and uh, very active. Toolchain, the company, is currently the lead sponsor of Pants, the open source project, yeah. and Toolchain exists to provide the uh, commercial framework that is very necessary around this sort of open source project. And so okay. people say, well, I, my company would like to use this, but we need enterprise level support, or we need mm. professional services, or we need the sort of SaaS, uh, the remote execution and caching capabilities that make a system like this really fast at scale. And so we exist to provide all of that and to really help organizations of all sizes speed up their testing and packaging and building uh, workflows dramatically, both on the developer desktop and uh, more importantly, even in CI. That sounds awesome. That, that seems like a, a neat solution kind of around helping to maintain this open source thing. We, we've had that conversation a few times over the last, I don't know, two years of like, okay, how do how do we keep open source projects running and funded and so forth? And this seems like kind of an interesting sort of combination of that in the sense that organizations sometimes, you know, they definitely like open source and are, are using those tools, but often they're like, well, we would like to make sure of a certain set of things and maybe in some case some support. And that sounds like that's something that tool chain's providing in that case. Yes. Around uh, there's always this tragedy of the commons when it comes to open source. And there are many attempts to diffuse that or work around it. And we are definitely uh, trying to do that and provide a way uh, for companies to engage with open source, uh, with this specific open source project, in a way that is commercially suitable to them, but also respectful of the open source community. Yeah, sounds great. It's a nice combination. As somebody who is trying to get more involved in understanding the tools like this, I wonder, is something CI, is continuous integration something that an individual should use? I think it's never too early to get into the best practices of software quality control. Yeah, okay. What are some of the components that you need to have in a system like this? So when you first learn how to program, how to how to code, it's very, you know, you're learning your for loops and branches and how to throw exceptions and handle them, etc. And that's all great. But when you actually start to build things, so much of the focus is not on that anymore. It's on what are you doing for quality control? And so you have to start thinking about how do I write code that is testable and how do I write those tests? Then you start thinking about how do I run those tests uh, effectively? Uh, how do I iterate quickly? How do I make sure that all the quality control checks that I have aren't slowing me down? And that's when you start getting into how do I design my CI? What kind of tooling uh, do I need? Yeah. And so that is a skill you pick up more in industry than you do in academia um, or in any kind of 
when you learn programming or computer science, it's very much focused on the how can I build things. And when you actually start doing engineering in industry, you learn much more about how do I stop all this from falling apart? Yeah. And it kind of leads to this idea of how can I make sure that my work can integrate with the work of everyone else (laughs) and not step all over it in some ways. Uh, I was reading some of your other articles and things and that we may ask about later (laughs) when you get into it, like uh, things like mono repos and some of these other ideas that are, you know, much more toward like a larger organization. But that was kind of the conversation I was having in episode 49 was like this idea of developing into a Python professional, this idea that when you look at structuring code or potentially making changes to it or modifying things like structurally, what are the kinds of things you need to look at? But this goes to the point of on the flip side of that almost like like okay you've rewritten that code (laughs) now what right yeah and so there's a whole bunch of steps that are involved there you mentioned one already the idea of like okay that code needs to be tested when did you get involved in all this like what was that very early for you or right when you got out of school no not at all so i entered industry very naive I think like many people do. Actually, today people may be less naive because internships are more of a thing. Okay. But back in the day, I had zero industry experience, went into industry, and suddenly realized that my knowledge and skills were only a, you know, 30% of the actual job. (laughs) Okay, But I was pretty content with, you know, whatever existing tooling was there. And, you know, when you're very junior, you don't ask a lot of questions. You just accept things over the way they are. A really eye-opening experience for me was uh, after five years at other companies, I went to work for Google. And Google is well known for putting a, even back then, a tremendous emphasis on developer productivity, on best practices, on code quality, and on the tools to enforce all of that. And so that was my first encounter with tools that were good by the standards of the time. I'm sure they've improved dramatically since then, but more of a uh, attitude and a frame of mind that says that tooling and code quality and best practices really, really matter. And so that's when I first encountered, that was the example for me. I got involved personally in developing these kinds of tools actually after I left Google and noticed that the rest of the industry had not in any way caught up. Okay. (laughs) And I was suddenly thrust like eight years back into the past to slow, flaky, broken builds, tooling that sort of just barely did what it was supposed to do and everything just felt incredibly fragile and Hmm. you'd make a tiny change and then testing it would take an hour and everything or you you know so people just wouldn't do it like people were not adhering to best practices the tooling wasn't there to support good practices that's when i started becoming actively involved in trying to fix this problem you you spotted the problem and said (laughs) this needs to be solved Well, the interesting observation, and I encourage all software engineers uh, and developers to think about this, is unlike almost every other profession, the tools we use to build and test and maintain software are themselves software tools. Yeah. So we uniquely have the ability to build our own tools. And so it takes that flash of insight to go, oh, wait a minute, I don't need to look to another industry or another set of skills and competencies to solve this problem. I have everything. I have all the abilities we need to solve this problem. So I am going to solve it. That's awesome. Can I ask you a question about, I I don't know if this is like public domain or not, but how would a company like Google share those things with a new employee? Was it something that you were sat down or somebody walked you through it? You were mentored in it or how, how were those practices shared? Well, I can honestly, it was a while ago, so I can hardly remember, but they had good documentation. Okay. And there is mentoring. Uh, Today, I would assume that, you know, Google is of the size, uh, companies of that size and scale and even much smaller ones have a properly structured multi-week onboarding university. That makes sense, yeah. When you started to look at this idea that you can invent the tools that you need to sort of solve this problem. What were, this is when at your time at like a different company at that point, were the, was the organization open to that idea of you saying, Hey, I'd like to solve this problem of 
how we're doing this. Were they open to that change? Yes, I think it very much depends on the organization. So when I worked at Twitter, it was this was when I first encountered the the need for these kinds of tools. And the company at the time had a lot of different repos. And so it was more of a local decision for a specific repo. Um, and people were open to it there. Um, when I went to Foursquare, they were much more centralized. They had one big repo, the mono repo, as you mentioned, that everyone was working in. And they were using Scala very heavily. Scala is, you know, very very featureful language and it's therefore slow to compile and and has at least at the time had some scalability challenges and Fosco is extremely open to anything that would improve the uh, compile times there so yes okay that's good so maybe we could talk about that a little more of like the I guess getting involved in it as an individual and learning some of these practices like where would I think maybe the first tool you know that a developer should know at this point is is version control and and most likely you know some version of git was that the tool that you were using at the time also i was just beginning to learn git that when i left google because google internally uses perforce which is uh, as a, not just a different tool but a very different set of idioms hmm. Okay. You have to unlearn everything else you've ever used before you start learning Git, because if your mind tries to convert idioms from one to the other, you will just, there's a very strong impedance mismatch there. <laughs> so, yeah, so I was still learning Git. Would you say that's changed across the industry in some ways, that, that it's become more of a standard, or no? Git's pretty much the standard okay. almost everywhere now, yeah. yeah. All right, that's interesting. I don't, I don't know about the early days of version control, having kind of came into it much, much late over the last like you know seven eight years or so so yeah no at my very first job i was using cvs which is prehistoric by today's standards uh now <laughs> okay. git is obviously the standard and is the first for, for all but the very largest uh, code bases where git won't quite scale okay so uh the first thing anyone should learn is git properly yes okay so once the person has some of that down and understands the the fundamental concepts of that and can use it as an individual, what's like a, the next step there? So I'll focus on Python, obviously. Okay. The thing that happens with uh, the Python tooling, there are a lot. The Python tool chain is very rich. There are huge numbers of tools out there. Right? There's pip and setup tools and uh, just, you know, for the basics of building and PyTest and Flake 8 and Black and MyPy and PyWrite and uh, Doc Formatter and, you know, there's so many. I could list <laughs> 20, 25 tools and they all, yeah. it's sort of like having a Swiss Army knife, but without the Swiss, just the blades, just a box full of Swiss Army knife blades with no knife. And you have to, so people start putting together workflows based on all these tools, usually by scripting them up in some way. All right. And so the next thing you need to figure out is, well, what is my, what do my developer workflows look like? Python doesn't have a compile step. And so people think, well, I don't really need any kind of, there is no build per se, but that is a misconception. Just because you don't have a compile step doesn't mean you don't have a build and need some kind of framework for reasoning about that build because build includes running tests, build includes running linters and formatters, build includes packaging, build includes if you're using any kind of code generation. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, if you are using type annotations and you're doing type checking using MyPy or PyWrite, then you sort of do have a compile phase. It's not yeah. generating uh, object code, but it is doing a type checking. Uh, so it's similar in many ways to a compiler. And as an aside, I will never go back to non-type annotated Python. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's been a, one of these things that, you know, again, as I started the show three years ago, it's definitely become occasionally contentious, but mostly the people that I talk to are interested if they're going to work with others, <laughs> yeah. if you will, or their code works with other code, yeah. that they're very interested in it. And that brought me in very early on too. I, I'm, I repeat the story often, but there were these things about Python that I would look at it and going beyond the tutorial, quote unquote, type of stuff that you you see, you would see other people's code and you go, what are those things? And 
it was uh, decorators and then type hints were like the first two things. I was like, okay, these, I need to understand what these are because I'm seeing them all over the place and they don't quite make sense what they do. Yeah. And so um, it's definitely been a thing that's been building up across <laughs> not only my time of doing the show, but yeah. everywhere else. So I, th- I think you're in, 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 in the, you know, along with the, what was it put as uh, the parade of, of uh, recent additions to Python <laughs> I <laughs> and peps <laughs> cannot recommend type checking highly enough in that world it is yeah so yeah so you start to think about okay there are all these tools out there there are all these things how do i put them together into a set of processes that are useful to me and also useful for collaboration because okay you know very quickly you learn that when you learn programming uh typically you learn it as a solitary event (laughs) as a solitary activity but as soon as you do any real world programming, you realize that it is actually a team discipline. And so your processes need to take that into account. Yeah. And so that is where a tool like Pants comes into play. That is the one ring to rule them all, if you like. It is the thing that can build these workflows for you, orchest- install and configure and orchestrate all of those many underlying tools. Pants, I think, out of the box supports over 20 python tools today okay builds these workflows out of them and then runs them really efficiently without you having to learn how to use each separate tool nice so like in a way you mentioned the idea of all these individual blades or instruments that would go into a swiss army knife this is going to be the the shell that can hold them all and uh combine them in a way safely that you can put it in your pocket exactly it knows it's more than that because it knows i I think my swiss army knife (laughs) example kind of falls apart because this actually will okay (laughs) it it, it actually knows when to use which blade and in which order and when they can be used concurrently and when they need to be used sequentially and when the results of using one tool can, can be cached and when it can't and sort of it knows how to understand changes to your code and so it can say things like like, well, I only actually need to run these tests and not all of the tests because I can tell that the, I have the, the cached results for these other tests are still valid because none of their transitive inputs have changed. So there's a lot of, it's more than just a shell that helps you run some other tools. It's actually knows when you, you say, you, you give Pants a very high level command, like give me the results for all the tests and it will figure out what that means in terms of, well, actually, you know, some of these are cached and some of these uh, intermediate results are cached. And so I only need to run these other ones and I can run them concurrently on on all the cores on the machine because I know through dependency analysis that they don't depend on each other. Okay. And so it's really more of a workflow orchestration tool that lets you com- basically for the most part, ignore what the underlying tools are doing, how to configure them, how to set them up, how to provide them with inputs, what to do with their outputs. It chains them all together in the right sequence. So it lets you not have to worry about all of these sort of single purpose tools because you express a much higher level need to uh, pants and pants converts that into all the potentially hundreds of calls to these underlying tools. And it's going to abstract that all to make it much more like a, a couple steps as opposed to potentially 50 or more steps. Correct. Are you building real-time applications? Check out InfluxDB, time series platform. InfluxDB is optimized for developer productivity, so developers can build IoT, analytics, and cloud applications quickly and at scale. With its data collectors and scripting languages, a common API across the entire platform, and highly performant time series engine and storage, InfluxDB makes it easy to build once and deploy across multiple products and environments, at the edge, on-prem, or in the cloud. Check it out and start for free at InfluxData.com. That's I-N-F-L-U-X-D-A-T-A dot com. There's there's this thing that I noticed in the your initial page, uh, the sort of welcome to pants page. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I just wanted to get get an idea what, what fine grained invalidation means. So that basically means as I iterate, I'm making changes. Yeah, 
And those changes invalidate some previous work that has been done. So let's say I came in in the morning, pulled a bunch of work from, you know, my, my coworkers work from GitHub and ran tests to establish a baseline. And then all the tests ran because like everything has changed. Now I make an edit. Let's say I just go and edit a single file, okay, a single source file somewhere. Now, naively, I want to, I want to check sort of the, what effect my change has had. Naively, I need to run all the tests. A naive system will now say, well, you got to run all the tests because I don't know exactly which ones have been affected by your change. Yeah, okay. fine grain invalidation says the system is smart enough through dependency analysis. It actually looks at chains of import statements and it understands your transitive dependencies. So it can say, in practice, this change only affects, you know, these 10 tests out of your 500 tests. And so when you ask the system to rerun all the tests, it actually says, well, 490 of them I can pull straight out of cache and it takes no time at all. And I'm only actually going to take time to run these 10 tests because those are the ones that are actually affected by changes to your code. Okay, those have been touched in some way. Correct. And it does this analysis correctly, transitively. It also doesn't obviously just look at file changes, but also config changes and changes on your system. So it's smart and the caching is very robust. Um, We've essentially never had a cache mistake in that sense of thinking something should can be cached when it couldn't be. Is that unique in some ways? So that it sounds like that you were solving a problem that other systems maybe were just say okay, run 100. percent So other systems either run 100 percent or they let you manually try and figure that out, which is obviously a nightmare very quickly. (laughs) <laughs> right. You'd rather run 100% right. possibly. But there are other systems out there that can potentially do, other build systems that can potentially do uh, similar uh, invalid, fine-grained invalidation, but they rely on a huge amount of metadata that you provide. You have to write these um, this metadata in, in these so-called build files where you say, this module depends on this module, or this package depends on that package, etc. Uh-huh. And that is extremely laborious, thousands and thousands of lines of dependency metadata that the system can then use to figure out that invalidation. And because it's so laborious, A, there are often a lot of mistakes in it, and B, particularly mistakes in where you don't remove dependencies that are no longer necessary because it's a little hard to prove that a dependency isn't necessary. Hmm. And very often they're not written at a very fine-grained level because imagine doing that for every file. That just seems so laborious as to not be worth it. So people do it maybe at the package level or the parent package level, and the data starts to get less fine-grained. What is unique about Pants is that it does all of this through static analysis. So what that means is it actually, at runtime, looks at the import statements in your code and figures out your dependencies that way. Okay, kind of builds like a tree of sorts through all of that. Correct. And obviously it does that with a lot of caching, and and so it's very uh, efficient. And you can override those sometimes you have a dependency that isn't reflected by an import statement. So you can either customize how Pants learns about imports, or you can just manually add an import in a build file. But the point is you don't have to do that for every single uh, dependency like you do with other systems. So the part that I would say is absolutely unique is you get this fine-grained invalidation where the system can figure out at the f- at the granularity of a single file, so as fine-grained as, as it's possible to be, how things invalidate, without you having to write huge amounts of metadata to back up that logic. That sounds great. That sounds like a a nice uh, (laughs) trick to save a lot of time um, having looked at the the process of writing like YAML files and things like that. Yeah, so it gets horrific pretty quickly. And what people end up doing very often when they're using those other systems is writing scripts or using various tools to try and use static analysis to look at your import statements and then emit them into these build files. But then, A, you're checking in thousands of lines of generated stuff, and B, these files also sometimes need to be edited by hand. And having files that are partially machine-generated and partially uh, human-edited is really error-prone and difficult. And we just decided to uh, do away with all of that, and that was a deep uh, part of the design of the system. And it's been... People love it. I love it. It's a really great feature. Is that part of like version two there? That correct that is unique to it. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, so we mentioned some of the tools to kind of get started. If you were suggesting someone to start today and get going, and they 
let's say they're familiar with their linter, their code formatter, their tool for ordering imports, <laughs> yeah, and all those sorts of things. Do you feel that they need to get practice in in how those tools work before they move into like a, a more elaborate integration system? Not necessarily, no, but I do think they need to know why they are using all those things. Okay. So, yeah. And because then it, it, when you use something like Pants, it's very easy to turn on. Let's say you know you're using Black and MyPy and iSort and Flake 8. There's just, you know, it's one line of config to just say, make Pants do all that for, you know, run those for me. But you need to know why. Okay. Y- you need to have a sense of what you and your team and your organization considers to be good code quality control. And then I think once you have a sense of what it is that you want, pants can, like you don't want to be just trying to adopt something like pants and then just throwing a bunch of switches on right. for, for, for no reason. Like n- know what it is that you want, but <laughs> pants will make it very easy for you to do that. And it also sets a good example, right? So I think the obvious things that everybody should intuit that they need is tests. You need good tests and good test coverage. And, you know, you need to, you have just no reassurance that anything code you've written is useful for anything at all unless it, there are some really good tests for it. A system like Pants can run your tests. It can uh, calculate test coverage, etc., but it can't actually tell you, are your tests good and meaningful? Right. And that is a huge part of the skill. So I'd say the number one thing to focus on is, are my tests actually reassuring me about the quality of my code? So if someone was going to look at moving into this direction and getting more comfortable with it, they should be familiar with some of these other kind of names that we mentioned before of tools that kind of look at your code. But the first step may be to get good at just understanding tests and how to integrate them and make sure that they're they're set up properly. Do you suggest a particular tool? Um, so PyTest is basically the standard. Yeah. Once you have got some tests running with PyTest, again, Pants will just install and run PyTest for you, et cetera. And you, there's, you can start using Pants very early because it get, it takes away a lot of the difficulty of installing PyTest and figuring it out separately from all the other tools. But it's more about authorship. So running linters and formatters is easy, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that, that's there's very little required. Running MyPy is relatively easy. Again, Pants will make that a lot easier, but you have to write type annotations and you have to understand that world. Right. But writing tests is a skill that needs to be learned and writing code that is testable True. is also a skill that needs to be learned. And no tooling in the world, like that is the art of software engineering in a nutshell, and no tool in the world will help you if you your code isn't written to be testable and you are not actually writing good tests for it. Yeah. So that's just a, definitely a skill to, <laughs> if, you're, if you're not familiar with that, that, that may be where to start before yeah. advancing yeah. forward. Yeah. And then the other thing I think that is really worth paying attention to and is, is a bit of a flesh wound in the Python world at the moment is packaging and deployment, yeah. sort of the other side of things. There are not, there are still isn't a strong story there. So for example, the Python standard around that is you build, you set up Py or similar to build a distribution, right? A wheel or an SDist, and that gets consumed by another repo, et cetera. But it's clunky because it means that code sharing has to go through versioned publishing. And in a sort of mono repo environment, and I guess we haven't really defined that, so we can get into that. Yeah, but basically, sure. in a in a repo where uh, you know a, a large growing repo where you build lots of different things and lots of people collaborate in that repo, you don't want to share code through publishing. You want to share code directly in the repo. And so, one thing that Pants offers this is also a standalone tool you can use outside of Pants, but Pants integrates very well with it. Is a thing called Pex, and is Pex is something we've built and we maintain that it's short for Python executable, and it basically builds a single... Is it P-E-X then? P-E-X. Okay. And it builds a single file that is a deployable file that contains all of your Python code and all of its uh, dependencies from your repo, plus all of the third-party requirements already as built wheels. And so it's a single file you can 
an executable file. You can literally just run it. When it runs, it looks for a Python interpreter on the system uh, that's suitable of, of a suitable version for the code that's within it, and then it runs itself, and it, it does this very efficiently. And so we have, that is kind of our answer to Python deployment. There are also ways to do things like turn Apex into a Lambda for running in a serverless uh, in, in a serverless environment. Uh, there are ways, uh, easy ways to embed Apex inside a Docker image, if that's how you're deploying. Okay. But there is a, we've attempted to provide a really robust answer to the how do I deploy Python code to production uh, question, which uh, is still a bit of a, fragmented story in the python world no it it it's, comes up all the time <laughs> yeah yeah we talk about it all the time on here and that talks to the idea of okay i'm an individual and i'm moving from writing scripts to actually writing a project that has lots of different components and parts and so forth and then now i'm looking at working with a group of people and now we have to look at like, well, okay, if someone else is going to join us, <laughs> how do they get the code? How you know how can I deploy it to them? And potentially, that may be just for the, an organization, right? Like it may just be like an internal type of thing. That's how I see the PEX kind of format being used. Does that make sense? Like it would be more for, it's not something that... Is there a solution to go to something like PyPI with that? Or is this more for the idea of like internal repository and sharing with in sort of uh, people within an organization or people that maybe want to use your, your project? Uh, no. So I should emphasize that PEX specifically is a deployment. It's for deploying to servers. It's for deploying to production. It's not for code sharing okay. between humans at all. It's not for code sharing across repos. Okay, so this is sort of like ready to use code. This is the code. This is what you build to, uh, yeah, to deploy your server. And I should mention, it's called a P Python executable, but it doesn't bundle today. It does not bundle the Python interpreter itself. But we are currently actively working on a solution that bundles not just the code, but also the interpreter itself. So now you truly can deploy it to a platform that doesn't even have a Python interpreter on it, and it will run. But none of this is, this is totally about production. Yeah, when okay. it comes to sharing code, so we are... You can do the thing people do today, which is you can use Pants to build a distribution and push it, you know, publish it to PyPI or to your private PyPI-like server and share it that way. But... We are, as a team, and as somewhat opinionated about how code sharing should work within an organization and Pants supports what we believe is very often a better solution, which is the monorepo. And in a monorepo, essentially everybody, potentially even hundreds or thousands of engineers are all collaborating on a single large repo and many different services and binaries and Docker images and lambdas and whatever are published out of that same or, or deployed out of that same repo. And possibly it contains code in multiple languages and it contains code for multiple products and multiple projects. And they all share code literally by that code just all being in the repo. And so what that gets rid of is the versioning hell Right, so we're all familiar with some version in the JVM world. It's called jar hell, uh, or we can call it dependency hell, where if you share code through a, a sort of versioned, published versioned code artifacts, which is how you, on PyPI, which is how you have to share third-party code that you don't publish yourself. Right, you end up with the you know these sort of diamond problems where uh, it's hard to find a mutually compatible set of transitive dependencies that work for all of uh, your code. So I depend on A and B, and A and B each depend on different versions of C, but you can only have one version of C pick, so which one do you pick? Mm. Like that is a very well known, very difficult problem. And PIP attempts to solve it through, you know, this is a bunch of heuristics, but there are very few guarantees that it the thing it picks will actually work. And we've anyone who's done this for any length of time ends up with noticing problems. And so you do not want to introduce that 
that, that problem is sort of a bit necessary, unfortunately, in with third party dependencies, but you absolutely do not want to introduce that to your first party dependencies, in my opinion. Okay. Within inside the organization. Within your own organization. And the nice thing about deploying, you know, having a, a monorepo is that the versioning is the same as the Git versioning. Essentially, the version you get of everything is the version at the current git sha that you're on and when you build a, across the repo. and when you build a binary you are building it you completely control the versioning of every single file is is the version of that file at the same version uh, at, at the git sha and so what that means is if i make a change i can't just make a change and not worry about who it's going to break which is what inevitably happens when you go via publishing if i make a change in the repo tests will start to fail in the repo and so this is a great example of how to enforce code quality. If I make a change, I am res- and it's I, and all the consumers of my change are in the same repo. It's very easy for me to find them, make sure all their tests pass. Now, of course, that means there are a lot of tests to run because my change could have ripple effects throughout this entire giant repo, and that's exactly where a tool like Pants comes in because it will only run the tests that are in fact actually affected by your change. Right. All of these items touch this thing that's changed right okay whereas when you work through publishing you have no way of knowing who is consuming your changes and you technically think you don't need to worry about it because they're consuming an earlier version but as soon as they upgrade which they inevitably will months later perhaps they will pick up your change everything will break maybe you've left the company now or maybe you've moved to another team (laughs) they have no context for your change anymore okay and so a monorepo enforces good collegial coding practices, if I make a change, I am responsible for making sure that the the impacts of those changes are not breaking things. And, you know, there are arguments for and against monorepos. I think it is increasingly becoming more and more common to see them in uh, organizations. It It is an increasingly popular architecture for your code base, as evidenced by the fact that many large companies, uh, including Google, have been using monorepos for a long time. And many times the arguments against monorepo are that the, you know, the sort of standard Python tooling doesn't really work with them very well. And so that is one of the problems that Pants is solving. And it's sort of saying, no, nope, you don't have that excuse anymore. Pants is, works, re- takes the existing Python tool chain, makes it work really well in a monorepo. So don't use that as a reason not to have one. <laughs> yeah. This week, I want to shine a spotlight and another real Python video course. It covers the topic we touch on this week, which is also a common next step for intermediate developers, beginning to test your Python code. It's titled Testing Your Code with PyTest, and it's based on a real Python tutorial by previous guest Dane Hillard. And in the video course, my frequent co-host Christopher Trudeau shows you what benefits PyTest offers, how to ensure your tests are stateless, how to make repetitious tests more comprehensible, how to run subsets of tests by name or custom groups. And it also gets into how to create and maintain reusable testing utilities. Testing your code brings a wide variety of benefits. It increases your confidence that your code behaves as you expect and ensures that changes to your code won't cause regressions. This course is a quick way to get up to speed with PyTest, one of the best tools you can use to boost your testing productivity. Real Python video courses are broken into easily consumable sections, and where needed, include code examples for the techniques shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. You mentioned several times now, at least I can feel this sort of directionality of this tool moving more and more toward Python type of tooling and so forth, is that, what are some of the reasons for that? Like, is it more like use of Python or uh, advantages it provides, or are you trying to solve problems like you just mentioned? Well, so what happened in the last 10 years so when we first started messing around in this space as i mentioned like in the early 2010s when we were generating ant xml files or whatever like the focus then was very much on jvm and particularly on scala because that's what you know those handful of companies happened to be using but in the intervening 10 years uh, python has undergone a 
an incredible revolution. Yeah. It went from, you know, I remember back in the day that Python was essentially, it was like nicer bash, right? It was the shell script around <laughs> right. the edges of things that you just like wrote throwaway scripts in. You didn't apply good software engineering practices to it because it was like, it was the duct tape that you used to duct tape the your real code together in. But now Python is a... I believe it's now the most popular language by some metrics. Uh, and it is yeah. obviously the language of choice for data science and machine learning. And that is why one of the reasons for its uh, immense popularity. It's also really popular for building web apps through like Django and Flask and things like that. It's also has always been, I think, a really popular language for DevOps, but DevOps itself has become more of a first-class use case, and it's no longer acceptable to just have a bunch of throwaway scripts. You're you're expected to to manage your um, DevOps in in uh, production and even in your corporate environment. You're expected you you expect that code to be rigorous. Yeah. So Python has just exploded, and the tooling has not kept up. Most of the existing build systems, all the existing build systems really are focused either on the sort of C, C++ world or on the JVM world, or they're very focused on like JavaScript or they're very focused, you know, Rust has it, it's a wonderful language and has its own sort of very tight tool chain that's really just for building single Rust binaries. So there really wasn't any tool that was focusing on Python and Python is a rich interesting ecosystem with a lot of history behind it now and you can't just like jam it into a jvm oriented system and expect it to work well it has its own idioms and so we wanted to build something all the hooks we've been talking about at this point (laughs) exactly so we wanted to build something that could provide an answer for this rapidly growing really popular language that i think hits a sweet spot for a lot of people and there wasn't really the higher level tooling there was all this lower level single purpose tooling we we've, we've named a bunch of them already this thing just runs tests and this thing just sorts your imports and this thing does type checking and this thing does formatting and yeah. uh, this other thing does formatting but in a different format <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but there was nothing to really bring it together into the kind of higher level workflows that you really need when you're starting to build really significant capabilities and really significant code bases and building, you know, entire multi-billion dollar companies around Python. Yeah. And so that is why there was a focus on Python. Now, I should say, we support Go, we support Java, we support Scala, we support Kotlin, we support Shell, we're looking into Rust and JavaScript, and uh, it's we have a plug-in API, so it's actually not terribly uh, hard to add support for other languages, and people have done that. They've added internal plugins for various things they've needed. But the Python, the really strong Python support was a huge it factored into the design of this sort of v2 pants right from the start because we knew it was such an important use case i was thinking about kind of climbing several steps backwards and thinking because you mentioned it also is i think of a lot of data scientists and them getting started with the idea of continuous integration and, and testing and all those sorts of things and i wonder about that as a solution would somebody need to maybe move beyond working inside of a notebook and look at potentially other ways of trying to implement this? So that's a really good question. It used to be in the sort of very early days of data science that you had the, you know, the PhDs, the boffins in the back room, like writing God knows what, like probably they would admit horrible Python code because that's not their goal to like create some sort of models or do whatever it is they're doing and then sort of throw it over the wall to the software engineers to somehow turn into a uh, <laughs> right. turn, turn this ma- into a magic into like a deployable thing now i think there's obviously we've evolved a lot since then there's this large and growing recognition that no the sort of data science machine learning pipeline from the building models, training them, them, whatever the analysis is that you're doing, like the pipeline from that to production needs to be a much smoother one and there need to be right. good software engineering practices all along the way. So everything needs to be tested. So, for example, Pants has integrations with Jupyter Notebooks and we uh, have, you know, I'd say a, a, a huge chunk of our user base is, in fact, Uh, data science oriented teams where they want tooling to take away a lot of the pain of 
to abstract away a lot of the pain of running, you know, doing uh, code quality and development workflows on data science type type use cases. Yeah, if they could set up a a recipe to to run this stuff, they can. And then also the the idea of like you're talking about the deploying to servers, which is a, such a common thing. Yeah, you know, once you get the the initial stuff sort of set up, yeah. and you want to run it at scale, if you will. <laughs> right. So it's much easier to say to a data scientist who, you know, does not want to be hacking on directly on a bunch of underlying tools instead of saying like, well, here's, you know, six different tools you need to run and here's the exact command line you need to run them with, but you need to make these, cha-. you know, you can just say, just run pants test. Like, that's it. That That's all you have to type and the right thing will happen. Yeah. That That is very compelling to data science teams that really don't want to hack on their tools like some engineers like me take a great interest in the in the underlying tools and want to hack on them but most people don't and most people shouldn't there's there's no (laughs) there's no virtue in it right like tools exist for people to get their jobs done and sort of expecting everyone to be really proficient in the internals and the details and the command line flags of every single one of like 15 different tools they use is not reasonable yeah, I I think that's funny because I I feel like people find their specialty, you know, like some people like yourself are very interested in building tools to make other people's lives easier <laughs> in, in the software world, you know, and other people, you know, like a data scientist is very much interested in this particular scientific problem and these things kind of get in their way and it's, it's I always like getting those different perspectives, so it's that's been fun to <laughs> kind of tease out from uh, from your history. Yeah. I mean, I'm also trying to make my own life easier, frankly. <laughs> sure. I, I'm hacking on tools for now so that I don't always have to be doing it. Yeah, definitely. You know, there's, it's a very evolving space. There's a lot of interesting things going on in it. And I think just the concept of these higher level workflows that provide not just order and rigor and repeatability, but also uh, performance as your code base grows and your uh, quality control checks, your tests uh, take longer and longer to run. I think that's the really important takeaway that there is tooling here to help you have really to, to adopt and maintain uh, really good practices around code quality. Yeah, sort of set yourself up for some success here yeah. moving forward. Yep. How how does somebody get started using this tool? So you go to pantsbuild.org or pantsbuild one word and follow the sort of how to get set up instructions and we strongly encourage you there's a you know you click on the link to the uh, community and that will lead you to our Slack workspace and that is a really oh, good place to come and say hi so one thing we maybe didn't mention uh, much about was the community around pants so toolchain the company i co-founded is the lead sponsor and obviously we've done a lot of work on it over the years but we are far from the only people working on it so there's a big friendly community of people from many uh, different companies either hacking on pants themselves or answering questions and it's a it's a community where we pride ourselves on being very uh, friendly to anyone sometimes open source projects can be a little prickly <laughs> yeah you know we we put a lot of effort into being very welcoming and friendly and our unofficial motto is at least my unofficial motto is that there are no bad questions only bad documentation yeah that's good <laughs> And so I recommend coming in. So in the welcome channel, just come and say hi and introduce yourself and say like why you're, how you found out about pants. Certainly mention if you heard about pants on this podcast, then mention that. Yeah. And what your interest is and what your use cases are. And, you know, it's a big friendly community. And between the documentation and the community, I think you can get set up pretty quickly. Yeah. I'd say the documentation is... I think we've heard people say, like, this is really good for an open source project. But unfortunately, that's damning with faint praise because most open source (laughs) projects have really bad documentation. So ours is good by that standard. There is still a lot to improve in the documentation. And, um, you know, that's a 
project we would like to fund and, and do at some point, add more tutorials, etc. And we've always mentioned that that's something that that's a great way to get started in in contributing to open sources is offering to help in those areas. Oh, we very much welcome documentation fixes. The documentation is all in the is generated from sources in the repo. So it's really if you know how to use Git, you know how to write and, and you know you know how to write to uh, improve the documentation. I should mention that it is very welcome contributions to the project and contributions do not necessarily mean code. They can mean documentation. They can mean helping other users. They can mean, yeah. you know, pr- helping promote the project, you know. Yeah, like you have example projects and repos yeah. for people to kind of test some of the stuff out. That's correct. We have a whole bunch of example. We have, you know, example-Python and example-Django to show some Django-specific features and example-Java and LJVM and uh, Kotlin and Go. And so there are a lot of ex- little in the pants build organizations, a lot of little repos that demonstrate how to use pants. And so, yeah, come by, come come say hi on Slack. If you feel like giving us a GitHub star, like we, we, we like those. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. They make they make us feel that it's not a very important metric, but it makes us feel appreciated. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's how I would get started. Awesome. So, Benji, I have these weekly recurring questions, and the first one is, what's something that you're excited about in the world of Python? I'm really excited for PyCon, which is in April, I believe, in uh, Salt Lake City again. So, yeah, we I had never been to PyCon uh, before, and then we did during the pandemic. We did the virtual PyCon, and we actually uh, spoke there and stuff. Okay, and you know <laughs> what can I say? I mean, I, I my hat is off to the PyCon organizers for uh, pulling off that virtual one. Um, but it ain't the same. And so this was my <laughs> Salt Lake City this year was my first PyCon and it was such a blast. Yeah. And so I am very, very excited for PyCon 2023 and uh, Salt Lake City is a fun city and the community is very welcoming, very friendly. One of the many things I love about Python. And I should, one thing I did not mention at all is that Pants itself is implemented partly in Python. So we are also purely for selfish reasons, very invested in, uh, yeah. in Python. And so, uh, yeah, I'm very excited for PyCon. It's so much fun. Did you do a talk or anything last year? I personally did not. Okay. Uh, but my coworker, Chris did. Okay. Chris Nogabauer. He, um, and it was a very well received talk. Yeah. Cool. Oh, um, if you toss it to me, I'll include the link. We'll do. All right. What's something you want to learn next? This doesn't have to be Python specific. I want to learn more Rust. Okay. So Pans is written in a combination of Python and Rust, and the two interoperate really well. And I think the model of writing Python where you want to iterate really quickly and then finding the sort of performance critical parts of your code, particularly the CPU bound ones and potentially rewriting them in Rust and having that Rust code interoperate with Python is such a powerful combination. And that's what we do with Pants, but I do not contribute uh, to the Rust side. And so my Rust is, my my Rust abilities are not strong. And I very much would love to be able to take a month off and go like really learn idiomatic Rust and just become really, really good at rust code because it is just what little work i have done in rust you know a little bug fix here and a little feature there has been such a joy oh good yeah it's a very common answer i'm I'm getting more intrigued all the time (laughs) i I thought about uh we were talking about it recently but the the idea of like idiomatic you know version uh, writing of particular code and you know, pythonic is an easy one and i was like okay what what is it for rust then is it rustic <laughs> oh good question yeah i rustic. haven't heard it yet <laughs> so i hope it's rustic cuz yeah. that just sounds excellent <laughs> yeah totally so how can people follow the work that you do online so as i've already mentioned pouncebuild.org that is from the open source side. And as I said, come come say hi. You know, there'll be links there to join the community, to join Slack. Come say hi. Then I would say, obviously, uh, GitHub. So we are pants build slash pants on GitHub, pants build organization, and then the pants uh, repo. As I said, GitHub star is always appreciated. Toolchain.com is the uh, corporate website. Uh, if you want to find out more about the commercial offerings uh, around pants and speeding up your builds, et cetera. And then finally, for as long as Twitter is still around, you can find me on Twitter <laughs> at uh, 
just Benji, B-E-N-J-Y. All right. Well, Benji, thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been really fun to talk to you. Uh, Thanks for having me on. This was a blast. And don't forget, easy to start and scale, InfluxDB time series platform is available in the cloud, on-premises, or locally. Get started for free today at InfluxData.com. I want to thank Benji Weinberger for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.